Uh, good morning from New York City again. We're still working on this Dirac equation, relativistic quantum mechanics, and this, I have another, I have more on the Dirac equation to come in. I'm going to divide the, the Dirac equation up into parts. I'm also going to introduce the shorthand version, covariant they call it, form. It's all covariant, but a particular type of notation, including the Feynman slash notation. And then everything becomes very compact, but as you get compact, you lose information. So what I've taught you so far carries a lot more information than the compact form. Today I want to derive the Pauli spin matrices. I have a bunch of quantum mechanics books, even my favourite, Gassiorovich, and ten others over there. Not one of them ever derives the Pauli spin matrices. Let's just get them. For example, Four, two forty-two. Yeah. All you ever get is this definition, where these matrices are the thought the Pauli spin matrices are the Pauli matrices. They satisfy these commutation relations. Then they go through that algebra, but they never show you where they come from, how to derive them. All the others are the same. And that annoys me. I even, saw, I even saw some guy on the web answer questions. I forget what the website was, but some people had questions, and one person said, how do you derive Pauli spin matrices? There are several different ways to do it. I'm going to do it three ways. Um, there are probably lots of different ways to do it, but I only know three. And then he gets all these fake answers, right? People just writing too much stuff and not giving an answer. So basically what gets dragged in here when we study the Dirac equation and relativistic quantum mechanics is spin and that degree of freedom um, as a purely quantum mechanical effect. I might talk about it in a different way, as an R scale effect, but it doesn't matter about that. We'll deal with it traditionally first. And uh, to do that properly, you have to do angular momentum. I haven't done angular momentum properly yet. I've done some aspects of it. I've done it in the classical sense. I will do a big whole thing on angular momentum. And I will do more Dirac equation and I'll do more spin as well. I'll do some of the algebra. In fact, as I get ideas, I'll do more things. But roughly speaking, angular momentum works like this. In solutions to Laplace's equation, you get spherical harmonics. Right? And when you operate on this, with the Laplacian, the eigenvalues, sorry, of L times L plus one get dragged out, okay? Now this for Laplace is a YLM, it's a spheric harmonic, I should have said that. So M goes from, let's say, let's say L is equal to one, for example. M is minus one, zero, and one. That's the way large scale spin works. So what we do in, uh, well, after the Stern Gerlich experiment, we carry over to quantum mechanical spin, but we use the same rules. Operating on some wave function, psi, which will have an L and an M value in it. Now, this S, Okay, there are two degrees of freedom. When the electron goes through the magnets in the Stern Gerlich experiment, Stern and Gerlich in Frankfurt, 1922, some of them get deflected upwards to a screen and some downwards. We call this spin up, spin down. Two degrees of freedom. So spin here is going to be S equals a half. Why? Why, two, why a half? Because you get two degrees of freedom out of it. When you subtract one from a half, you get minus negative a half. Okay, so that's the same kind of rule as we're doing here. We're moving up in steps of unity. So, when we have spin, spin can be half integers. When we have ordinary angular momentum on a la large scale, the spin, the L, is an integer. 
L is one, two, three, four, five, six, but in this case here, it's going to be half, three over two, and so on and so forth. So, if we put in S equals a half, we get three fourths H craft. H cross. I'm going to talk about this later on. This is just the, this, this is just a preliminary kind of a chat. Now, what happened in this Stern Gerlich experiment? You put the <coughs> electron going through an inhomogeneous magnetic field, right? That means it has some curvature here. It's actually a knife shape, so that you don't get straight field lines to split up the beam. There were reasons for that. Roughly speaking, I just said up and down. Okay, so what's the what about the Pauli matrices? Let's move on to those. Let's get rid of this general chat. And just say something. These psi functions are or orbital angular momentum or spin angular momentum. We denote the size just like this abstract thing. Right? It's just an abstract idea. It's just a notation because we're eventually going to st structure our matrices using these things, right? So for s equals a half, is a half also. Actually, I'll skip this. Let's move straight into the matrices. Sorry, guys. Now, an electron in the magnetic field has a Hamiltonian has, that has this kind of structure. Now, as it happens, this is a Hermitian matrix. It's a kind of a general Hermitian matrix. Hermitian matrices have diagonals, and then they have off diagonals. Sometimes it might be just diagonals. It's different. But the one down here is the complex conjugate. These are mutually complex conjugates of each other. And these are real ones down here, okay? They could be imaginary too. So mu is the magnetic moment of the electron in the magnetic field. Mu is h cross over 2mc as far as I remember. And as usual, ih cross d by dt psi, which is going to be the wave function, is going to be hij psi j. I wrote it that way because it's going to be this matrix form. And it's going to be something like this. I'm not going to bother with this just yet. Just want to look at the matrix. All right. There's a H crossover 2 here, by the way. So this, we could say mu dash. H cross over 2e over mc, it counts for the spin. So I could put the mu dash up here. Leave that out there. Okay? Now let's read off the first uh, matrix. This is bz, bz, bx, by, bx, by, with a positive sign and with a negative sign. It's a uh, permission matrix. This Every, by the way, just to remind you, everything, if it's to be a physical observable, in other words, something you can measure, angular momentum, linear momentum, energy, anything that you can mention, the matrix, its operator, right, has to be Hermitian, uh, emission operator. So some operator, which is Hermitian, if it's a matrix, you transpose it and take its conjure, and if it's that also is equal to O, then the matrix is Hermitian. The Hermitian matrix is its own complex conjugate transposed. <clears throat> so let's read off sigma 1. Sorry, sigma Z first. Now I lined up the magnetic field in the z direction on purpose because it doesn't the matrix doesn't have to have this structure. That's a, a kind of a special structure that just allows me to read off an easier case of the sigma matrices. 
If I set by and bx, by and bx to zero, I just get these two terms, you see? Now here's what happens. that the sigma matrices, the Pauli sigma matrices, allow us to write this matrix like this, in this form. So, sigma x and bx, sigma y and by, and this is like a dot product, sigma dot b. That's going to give me this, this h. Right? So, if we set the bx and by to zero, we're left with these two off diagonals. sigma z is going to have this form. Now outside we have the, I put the h cross over 2, I took it out at the magnetic moment. So sigma z is this one to incorporate spin in our sigmas. I can keep that in there too and rewrite our magnetic moment. There's that with a, a new dash. And I define a new matrix, which is just the, uh, the spin matrix, because of the eigenvalue h cross over 2 is multiplying on the sigma. All right? So therefore then, sigma z Now let's look at sigma x. This is the only requirement for the sigma matrices so far. It will generate an algebra and so on and so forth. But that, we'll do that later. We got sigma z, there it is up there. Let's look at sigma x. For sigma x, I will set bz equals 0 and by equals 0, and I get these two off diagonal terms. That's all I get, right? this, multiply by the bx, and I could use sx as well. And this would be uh, the spin matrix, spin operator if you like. And finally now I got sigma x up here. Now, sigma y, if I look closely at this, if I didn't have a, an eye in front of it, it would not be Hermitian, right? Okay, sigma y we read off by setting bz equals 0 and bx equals 0. And then I get this term and this term. So let's write those terms for sigma y. So, sigma y will look like this. So we did bz, sigma x is bz, sigma y, and we're doing now, and we did that one as well. And sigma y is going to be 1 minus 1. Sorry, i minus i, with off diagonals, with di as off diagonals, and diagonals are 0. Now I've got the Pauli sigma matrices from this physical knowledge, all right? There are yet other ways to do them. I can, there's a big long algebraic way, which I really like, because it's totally regular from first principles, and it's much more general. Let's see if I can move ahead anyway. All right, so I'll just keep this Pauli matrices up there. I'll get rid of this now.
actually, I'll just summarize this one for now. I'll do this method two in a separate talk. Oh, by the way, most books do publish that Hamiltonian, but how to get at it, you can check uh, your average quantum mechanics book just to write down that, or see where that Hamiltonian arises from. Okay. There, the Pali spin matrices. I will deal with the other versions of this and then deal with you know, the algebra of the sigma matrices later, for example. one in DRX equation. And uh, that'll do this for now. I'll post this one.